conference, which, which is always a pleasure to attend. Uh, uh, and uh, many other projects and activities which really make uh, our department as great as it is and as highly ranked as it is. Uh, students that participate in the ACM activities don't only, not only contribute to the department, but they continue to contribute to the industry uh, after they leave the department. And it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Max Levchin, who was an active member of ACM when he was a student here, uh, and uh, has gone and done wonderful things after leaving. Uh, from PayPal that uh, uh, truly leveled uh, the global uh, uh, economy and uh, uh, provided the uh, mechanism for payment which is essential to uh, today to uh, uh, internet business and to other uh, startups including his current one uh, and he has not only contributed uh, you know current one being Slidecom I'm sure he will tell you much more than I can, but uh, he not only contributed uh, uh, to the industry, he also contributes by hiring our students uh, and telling them what it takes to do uh, a startup, and he contributes by continuously coming back here and uh, speaking at our events and meeting with students. So on behalf of the department, uh, I want to give him a small token of recognition and on behalf, I suppose, of the ACM students. And what you got, uh, Max, is a tube from the ILIAC-4, which was where we started with computing. And, uh, you know, it's far from where we are now and where you took us now. So congratulations, Max, and thank you. Coolest gift I've ever gotten. <laughs> Thank you. Still work? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll find out later. Give us an Iliac fall. We should check. <laughs> wow, that's pretty sweet. All right, can you guys actually hear me? Yeah. All right. So, uh, So I was going to make some slides for this talk, but uh, my site crashed last night, so I stayed up all night trying to fix it. So uh, instead, I have some uh, low-power cliff notes that I took while I was trying to uh, bring the product back up. But uh, the, uh, the talk remains the same. There we go. Now if I start falling asleep and get confused about what the hell I was going to talk about, I can look at my notes and tell you. So, uh, so the topic that I wanted to cover is, um, as Mark said, I'm a big fan of uh, coming back here. And when I actually miss the university, and you know, I enjoy the cold a lot. And uh, I think Northern California is not what it's cracked up to be. It's just too warm, too nice, too, too easy. And so uh, I, I like to come back here and be reminded of my roots and uh, you know, the pain that you have to endure. It's always pleasant to uh, come back and uh, bring recruits or interns back to San Francisco because you sort of get in with like four layers and then as you get off the plane it's like, oh, maybe we should just go to the beach. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, can you hear me better now? All right. Yeah, um, anytime you feel like interrupting me, just scream and I may or may not be able to answer. Um, so, so the point of this talk sorry, I'll cut to the chase, is that you should start a company right now. So it, it's generally a good idea, and this is about the best time in history to do so. The, uh, the, the, you know, if you've taken economics classes, you'll probably know all sort of the, the components that make up modern capitalist economy are three things that I can't remember an entrepreneur. So uh, the entrepreneur is the important part. And entrepreneurship means starting a company. The interesting thing about being an entrepreneur, at least sort of the lesson that I've picked up over the last, all right, it's been 12 years, it's been a while since I graduated, um, that being an entrepreneur actually means desperately trying to start a company, any company, 
it almost doesn't matter. Like, you just don't want to do anything but start companies. And if you sort of feel that and you don't really care if the first one works, you just want to do the second one, that means you should go and start a company right now because you, you really have that gene. And um, it's, it's an important self-test you can conduct immediately after this talk is over. Just you know, lock yourself in a bathroom and look yourself in a mirror and ask, am I, am I ready to start a company even though I have no idea what it is? If the answer is yes, you're good to go. Um, to, well, to prove my point, uh, PayPal was actually founded to... Uh, do, uh, to develop security libraries for handheld devices. So when I was in school, I spent the first uh, three and a half years obsessing about computer graphics and was a chair of uh, SIGGRAPH while I was here. And then one day I got hit by something in the head and realized that I actually wanted to do cryptography and spend the rest of my time here just obsessing about cryptography. And so when I graduated, obviously what I wanted to do is go build hardcore crypto libraries and sell them to people who wanted to build software for handheld devices, of which at the time, there were maybe two dozen to go around for the entire world. And uh, that's right between the, uh, the Newton failure and the beginning of Palm Pilot, so there are really very few. And it was just a terrible idea. But I, I was certain that uh, that was the right thing to do at the time. So obviously, uh, PayPal wound up doing something a little bit different, although if you want, I can actually give you a very detailed path from that to uh, being a financial engine for the internet, but it's not really that important. The other random detail about starting companies is ideas are cheap. In fact, they're so cheap that you should not fixate on the idea. That's why it's okay to be mostly interested in just starting a company. Ideas are a dime a dozen. About 2% of any company is an idea. Usually people tell you 98% is hard work. I think 48% is hard work and 50% is a good team. So incidentally, trust me on that one, if you're thinking of starting a company, especially now when you're young and possibly inexperienced, you should probably do it in a company of someone else who is also young and possibly inexperienced. Because when there's a tough moment and you feel like you're failing and the whole world is getting you down, it's good to have someone next to you who is feeling exactly the same way and you can cry on each other's shoulder and decide what company you're going to start next. So, um, The other thing from... Uh, from starting companies is you will never get it right the first time. It's just a guarantee. And uh, PayPal was my fifth company. The first four failed in very rapid succession. First one failed when I was a junior here. I was abusing ACM equipment. I actually got run out of ACM office once for uh, trying to write code that I planned to sell on ACM computers. Fortunately, you know, at this point, the uh, people from engineering technology office. The guys who commercialize your code should be like coming in here with handcuffs to arrest me. Fortunately, the company failed. I never made a penny, so there's nothing to take away. But uh, I, I did break the university rules. So um, the, only, the only lesson learned there is you just got to change every time. You know, start with security for handheld devices and go for something crazy. Payments is a really bad business to be in. That's what everybody told me. Um, so that's sort of background. Entrepreneurship is cool. If you have the inkling, feel like you want to start a company, do it. Seriously, it's awesome. You'll never want to go back. Talk to me. I'll uh, yeah, puff you up on that one some more. The, uh, now, now to the actual content of the talk. So what, what I'm here to tell you is all the uh, penny secrets that I learned over the last 10 years trying to start companies in Silicon Valley. So first of all, Start a company on the web. Don't bother starting a company anywhere else. Most of you, I assume, are computer science, computer engineering, computer something majors. You're already predisposed. But even if you're an agricultural or you know, min-met major or something like that, just forget about it. Start a company on the web. There are lots of good reasons for it. The best ones are it is really cheap. You have no storage costs, no shelf life concerns, no shipping costs, no no, nothing costs. All you have to do is write software, put it on a server somewhere. It costs you about 200 bucks a month. The other reason why you'd want to do it on the web, you get really fast feedback. You can launch a product, show it to 10 friends. Within 24 hours, they'll tell you, this sucks. And then you'll know. If you decide, even if you're building a piece of hardware, which is really fun to build, and it, you know, it's great stuff to to work on when you're in ACM, 
Don't start a company around that. First thing you have to worry about is who's going to manufacture your product, because no matter how cool you think you are with a soldering iron, you're not going to want to do this forever. So you're going to have to outsource it to some fab or fabulous place somewhere far away, and you have to fly there a lot, and it, it, it's a pain. So, and they'll get it wrong. That's right. So fast feedback, low cost, means web. To further drill that one down, don't start a company selling software to enterprises. The best company to start is in consumer web. So directly to the people. A few reasons for that. It's probably, I'm probably going to offend someone who has a, a long-term career in sales in this room, but uh, sales really suck. So selling essentially involves going out to some guy's office who's got three concerns, and one is his kids, the other one is his wife, and the third one is his mistress, or something like that, where you rank really low on that list of concerns. And what are you telling him is, I got this thing, and it's going to reduce your cost by 15% and increase your margin by 14 and a half. And he's thinking, did I turn off the iron or not? <laughs> and you, know, you, you think that's not true? It really is. If you, if you haven't, uh, believe me on this one, watch a movie called Glengarry Glen Ross. It's the best caricature of uh, what the sales world is like. It is really like that. So the secondary level problem, this, this is where I'm going to offend some people in the room, you don't actually want to employ salespeople. So salespeople are people who survive that sort of environment. So they're used to coming up to somebody who's thinking, did I turn off the, the stove or the iron, or is my wife cheating on me? They're like, no, 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 listen to me. Come on, eyes on me. Buying, 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 you know. Your budget, it's unimportant, buy. Do you really want to work with people like that? <laughs> you do not, because they're selling you on something too. So what do you want to do is something that goes directly to consumer. The only choice that your customer has to make is show up on your website. And it's free. Just don't charge for anything. It always has to be free. There's lots of money to be made, incidentally, on consumers that does not involve taking the money from consumers. One model is called advertising, but there's 55 other business models. So trust me, uh, trust me on that one. Consumer web, it's where it's at. If you have a hard time believing that one, the uh, most recent company to be founded by the people from these very halls, YouTube, direct-to-consumer web, $1.65 billion in hard-earned dollars, uh, I think, a week ago and a half or that was announced. No salespeople there other than advertising sales, which is a little bit of a different beast, but uh, it's somewhat easy to do once you have more traffic than God, and YouTube is definitely uh, <laughs> appro approaching that number. At a certain point, incidentally, you can handle salespeople in your staff. That's when they're s you're so big and so important People actually show up with checkbooks and are saying, please take my money. At which point, your salespeople actually become more like accounting people and they're sort of like, yeah, <laughs> fine, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> the uh, one other, or two other points about being, building stuff for consumer web. I have no idea what the world is like out there, and you double because you've been cooking here for the last two and a half years on average. And so if you're not building a product for yourself, you're kidding yourself. How do you know what people want? You know that you, know, you want your free videos or uh, cool uh, icons or bling for your MySpace page. You know that, so you can go and build that. Do you know that somebody actually wants a traffic uh, router or accelerator, accelerator? Do you know how to spell that? I don't. So just build stuff that you know that you will want to use. And you're going to have to try to project that maybe two other people want to use it, and that's, that's your audience. And it's a, you know, 200% more than you. The, uh, the other thing that may be a little bit more serious, once you actually have a consumer product and it's modestly successful, the best thing about consumer products on the macroeconomic scale is you have homogeneity in your customer base. That means if one person says, you know what, I hate you. You have done this terrible thing to me. I'm never going to use your product. In fact, I'm going to go to your competitor. You go, oh yeah, so you are one of my 2 million users. All right. I can't calculate the percentage point of the customers I just lost. Who cares? If you're an enterprise sales business, you have five customers that you pitched for three months, and they bought in their nine-month cycle, and they're in pilot, and one of them says, I'm out of here. I don't want this anymore. You lost 20% of your customer base. Presumably, that impacts your expectation for profitability, but also your self-esteem. So lots of customers. One of them quits. Who cares? They quit in droves, you have a problem, but presumably you're going to somehow figure out how to stop that. 
as far as the skew of your uh, customer demographic, the younger the better. The world is shaped by the hands of the 20-year-old. That's you guys. I've recently exited that decade, so uh, I don't know anymore. But you do. And 20-year-olds will have much longer to live, more money to spend, and they can't remember the world without the internet. Once you're in the 30s, you actually remember when you know, we used hand cranks to calculate things, and so it's harder to convince them to try something out. 20-year-olds, best demographic. Incidentally, don't go below 13, that's illegal. <laughs> so if you're starting to write, trying to build a consumer business on, for the web, there are basically two things to get right, sort of a two-step process. Step one, it's called distribution, which is an industry jargon, and the other one is monetization. Monetization is pretty easy. That's how you, know, you figure out how not to go out of business because you're going to run out of money, which you don't have in the first place. Distribution is media, old media, sort of a Fox and Disney and ABC terminology for getting in front of lots and lots of people. When you're in a consumer business, you need distribution. The, the water that you drink, the bread that you eat, is the number of customers that come to your website every day. There are lots of different ways to get distribution. Most of them are very expensive. The thing to consider when you're trying to figure out a distribution strategy is just one thing alone. What is the lowest possible cost of acquiring the next set of eyeballs? So presumably, your consumers or your customers really are just a pair of eyes, unless they're disabled, in which case maybe they have one, and a pair of hands, same discount. So you don't really know that much about them, except that you know they showed up on your site because they typed in your URL or they clicked on a link, and then they're playing with it, so they're looking at it. The marginal cost of getting that next person to show up is all you need to care about. Because in the end, on average, you're going to have to make just a little bit more money to be profitable. So that, that's your entire economics of, for, for your web business. The distribution and monetization branch of thought can take up another five and a half talks. So uh, that's for next conference. So anyway, so what I was really going to here, this, this is all precursor to the real talk. Real talk is money and financing and venture funding and what, is, what does that mean. One of the interesting things that I found here is people who live in the valley, Silicon Valley, take the whole venture financing understanding for granted. And every time I come here, people sort of go, well, how do you get money to fund your startup? So I figured I'll brain dump on you guys everything I'd learned so far. Most of it is worthless, but you'll, you'll, uh, you'll find some of it amusing. So venture capitalism or venture capitalist is this whole industry that exists right next to the entrepreneurs. The uh, former world capital of venture capitalism is this place called Sand Hill Road in Menlo Park, California. It's this long road that sort of goes up this hill. It's actually very, very picturesque. It's very quaint. And uh, the pecking order of venture capitalists is pretty much directly correlated to their address. The world's best known venture capital firm, Sequoia Capital, had just funded YouTube and made a some obscene return on the YouTube sale, and prior to that, fu did fund PayPal and made some obscene return on a PayPal sale, is located at 3000 Sand Hill Road, which is incidentally the highest number you can have on Sand Hill Road. And sort of down from that, you have the Mayfields and the Kleiner Perkinses and the Morgan Thaler Ventures and Focus Ventures, and sort of down and down and down you go. At a certain point, you wind up in 2200, where you have the, uh, I think it's like a credit union. They don't really fund anyone, but that's the end of, uh, that's the end of Sand Hill Road. <laughs> Incidentally, I hear they're starting to try to launch a venture arm of their credit union business. So, uh, um, The point of venture capitalist is exactly what it sounds. They give you capital. The idea is that you're there to risk your time and your effort and build a company, and they're there to risk their money. The typical investment that a venture capitalist will take out on your idea is anywhere between 2 and $20 million. The interesting thing about venture capitalism that you learn time and time again is they do not think in terms of what is your idea really worth. The adage 10 years ago in Silicon Valley was any good idea is worth about a million dollars. You could show up with a resume that said, I just graduated from college, but I have this really awesome idea. As long as somebody believed you, they'd be like, okay, so that's, that's about a million dollars. What if it's completely crazy? It doesn't matter. That, that's how they think. What they're really thinking about, though, is what percentage of your company can I own for the amount of money that you want. And because they can't figure out what you're worth, because first time you're raising money, you're basically showing up saying, look, I have this thing, it's an idea. You think it's worth a million dollars, I think it's worth $50 million. Who's to say which one is right? So the only thing that really matters is the ownership that they get. 
the ownership, I assume you guys have enough econ behind your back to know that equity shares options probably more than uh, more than needs to be gotten into right now. But essentially, your company gets divided up into little chunks, and you get some chunks, and VCs get some chunks, and your employees get some chunks. After the first round of financing, the typical distribution of your equity is a third, a third, a third. Your investors have a third of your company. You, the founder, has a th you, the founders, may have close to a third. And then the employees in the future, people who will join you later, will all have a third. And some of, some of this last third is reserved. It doesn't have to be all spent at the same time. But it's really split into three. So what the venture capitalist is really thinking, saying your company is worth three times more money than what you're asking for. Because in the end, they're going to want to own 33% of your company. So when you show up and say, I want a million dollars, they're thinking, oh, it's a $3 million idea. When you show up and say, I want $10 million, they're thinking, oh, it's a $30 million idea. Independent of what you told them. I'll let you ponder that one separately. <laughs> but uh, there's an important trend in recent venture capital raises. If you show up telling them, look, I think this thing is worth $100 million, chances are they might believe you because they can't tell. <laughs> but you can. And if you're lying, or if you don't really believe yourself, it'll be pretty obvious. So the way this whole industry works is that the counter is very clear. If they look you in the eyes and you're actually lying, you won't be able to hold the show for too long, especially if you haven't done it too many times before. So <laughs> I'm, on the other hand, a professional. No. <laughs> if this sounds like a scam, No, no, no. PayPal raised uh, over a quarter billion dollars. Ponder that. I was not involved in any of the fundraising, incidentally. This is all ob observation from the side. But I've, I have become cynical. Incidentally, you have venture capitalists in Champaign-Urbana. They have multiplied far enough to actually have some VCs here. Um, they're uh, probably as good as the ones they have in Silicon Valley, possibly even better, because they can actually see what's going on in research. But uh, the ones in Silicon Valley get all the attention. The best VCs, the ones that you actually want to align yourself with. So the question is, what, what are they at other than money? So the typical conversation you'd have with a venture capitalist would be, so I have this thing, and it's worth $10 million, and I'm willing to sell you a stake in my company for 3.333. At which point, if they think you're full of it, they'll be like, oh, you know, well, let us get back to you. We'll be, we'll be in touch very soon and they'll send you a nice note later so they don't have to tell to your face we think you're full of it. The, the, the way that sounds incidentally is, I think we're going to pass on the opportunity, although we're certain you'll be very successful in the future. <laughs> Just remember that. Um, the people who are actually valuable, the venture capitalists that add value to your business, are the ones that help you beyond money. Money is quite green, and the vast majority of venture capitalists seem to have exactly the same color. The ones that are really good help you find other people to work with, put you in touch with other smart people that can help you out. But the really best kind are the ones that don't, just don't bother you. The ones that give you money and say, you know what, I trust you, you're awesome, just go kick ass. Those are the ones that invest in teams. So there are three philosophies for investing. They're team, product, and market. So the, the worst one is market. It's basically right now, today, while I'm telling you all this, there's a bunch of venture capitalists working overtime on Sand Hill Road. Well, it's kind of early for that, but they're probably there already. And there's a whole bunch of people there, and they're saying, YouTube, we're going to do exactly the same thing. Give us money. And some guys somewhere are going, yeah, I know, $1.6 billion. I'm going to put in a million into you and a million into you, and you guys are going to do all exactly the same thing. And any one of you guys making $10 million out of my one, done. That, that's what they want. They want 100. 10x return puts you in a Hall of Fame of venture capitalism. So, and they incidentally have absolutely no shame about uh, being copycats or funding people who are not the first ones. That's not what it's all about. It's, it's all about making money, which is exactly right. There's absolutely no, nothing wrong with it, nor should you feel like they're somehow selling out someone else's dream or your dream. They're just trying to make the most money for their fund. The ones that are really good so what I just described is the market investing strategy. Clearly, there's hot market for internet video. YouTube is the clear winner. They have just had a fantastic exit event. There are lots more room for number two, number three, number four. It's not clear who number two in the market is. 
some venture capitalist somewhere right now is taking a bet out on who's going to be number two. Because number two is probably going to be worth maybe a tenth of YouTube, which puts it at $165 million, which is a fair amount of money. That's a really bad strategy. Clearly, the people who really know what they're doing are number one. So number twos are not that exciting to invest in. There's some counters to that, but that's kind of the, uh, the general gist. The somewhat less terrible investment strategy is product. So you bring something to them, you say, look, I have a prototype. I need more money to build it. Let, you know, let's, let's take this thing to the sky. They say, yeah, you know, I'm not sure the market is there, but the, the product looks really good. So you know, let, let us give you some money, and you, you keep on building this thing. That's terrible. If the market isn't there, and they can't figure out if you're good enough, that's maybe that's actually the worst kind of strategy now that I think about it. The best strategy is to invest in people. If you show up and you're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and you have no idea what you're doing, and you're certain you're going to win, that is the best kind. That is the people I like to hire, the people I occasionally like to invest my own money with, and that's the people I recommend to my very few and far between venture capitalist friends. The ones who have absolutely no idea what they're doing and are just dying to succeed. That's the, the same kind that wants to start a company, any company. So really smart venture capitalists invest in people. And everything else is kind of secondary. So if you find one, you know they're pretty good. There's a technical digression into sort of how venture capital works. Venture, capitalist, venture capitalists manage funds. These funds are generally populated with cash that comes to them from large endowments or institutions. For example, the University of Illinois probably has some of its endowment in a venture capital fund or a private equity fund, which is very similar somewhere, possibly even the ones that are operating in Champaign-Urbana. Those people are known as limited partners, while the VCs themselves are known as the general partners. The general partners make the decision. Limited partners get to reap the benefits or eat the losses. The interesting thing about general partners is obviously they have to feed their families and go home to their nice cars and garages and expensive suburban houses. The way they get compensated is partially from the return and partially as a percentage of the total size of the fund. So if they raise a huge fund, they get compensated better, which creates this problem called the overhang. When the venture funds actually raise, collect more money to invest in you guys, that they know what to do with. Because there are only so many good teams to go around, and only so many good ideas, and only so many good markets. During the 99, 97, 98, 99 bubble, one of the most insane pieces of it that really didn't get a lot of coverage was this notion of overhang. There was something like $84 billion of uninvested venture capital that the VC industry basically had no idea what to do with. Because they raised so much money, because the promise of the internet future was so big and so hot, there was almost $100 billion to go around where it had, no one had any idea what to do with it. Hence, things like pets.com, for those of you who remember. If you've got to put it to work somewhere, might as well invest in someone who thinks they're going to make all their money by airing a commercial during the Super Bowl. There's also a second kind of investors, and they're somewhat less professional. They're known as angels, with the uh, weird in-between breed called the super angels, which will invest not sort of two to $20 million, but actually somewhere between 50000 to half a million dollars. On occasion, I've been known to uh, dabble in that from the uh, proceeds of the PayPal IPO, mostly for the enter entertainment and entrepreneurial desires of my friends. But the way angels get to happen is they're general entrepreneurs themselves that succeed somehow, have a, an exit event that's known, cash out for the more cr crass version, and then decide that they want to use the money to propel the industry forward or help young entrepreneurs, and invest small chunks of money, relatively small compared to venture capitalists, in other people's ideas. Try hard not to deal with those guys. They have two problems. That's not what they do professionally, so they're not disciplined. And because of that, they don't really know what they're doing, and they're annoying. They'll invite you over for dinner and start telling you how it was when they were young and doing a company themselves, and they'll teach you all sorts of things, give you a lecture like the one I'm giving you, and they probably have no idea what they're talking about. They're all much older than you are, or at least substantially older than you are. So um, they're a pain in the butt. Occasionally, there's some smart ones but they're few and far between. Hang on. I'll take lots of questions at the end, although I'm uh, 
I'm about 50% done with my content, and I'm about 75% done with my time. So uh, I'm going to start going faster. Faster, faster, faster. Um, enough trashing VCs. It's, it's fun to trash VCs, incidentally. I mean, part of the reason why entrepreneurs like to beat up on VCs so much, and this is a fine public forum to do so in, is because we depend on them. To uh, really make it big, it's pretty rare that you can bootstrap the company. Bootstrapping means you figure out how to be profitable from day one and use the proceeds of your usually tiny profits to make a little bit more money, invest it in the business, and sort of bootstrap yourself up and up and up. That takes longer. It's a less risky way, but it's also one that takes a lot of discipline and occasionally stifles sort of breakthrough progress that could actually be more fun and more profitable. So usually when you're trying to go for broke, which is what I would advise you to do while you're still young, is to raise some money. But the whole point of my talk is actually you don't need to do it. So what it changed in the last 10 years from the first bubble to the current one, and I don't really, I haven't had a chance to research this one yet, but uh, I believe there's a pretty massive overhang right now. I think there's plenty of VC money that ha has not found a lot of home. So it's actually not clear anymore that you must have VC financing from the start. What that means for you is you can actually preserve a lot more equity. The centerpiece of what's happening today is the 30-30-30 distribution of your equity may well be shifting towards more for the entrepreneur. Because 10 years ago, you needed to buy Sun servers, which are actually very expensive, like a, a nice Sun box to serve your uh, web traffic would run you about four grand. Today, you can get a $600 pizza box, which is built by some guy in San Jose, which is more powerful than the most powerful Sun box that you could buy 10 years ago in the same form factor. 10 years ago, you had to license Oracle because there was really not a good database product for you to run your backend on. Today, MySQL is actually faster than Oracle for simpler operations. Oracle is much more scalable and generally a better database by far. But if you treat MySQL as an advanced file system, it's actually just as good. It happens to be the low, low price of nothing. The best thing about today's environment for starting companies is there are huge collections of tool sets that allow you to build websites very, very quickly. So these sort of three that come to mind are Ruby on Rails, PHP, and Python Django. I'm a big fan of Python. I think it's probably one of the more beautiful programming languages, so that's the one I use for just about everything I do these days. Lots of people like Ruby. I think they're all sort of similar. These are high-level languages that allow you to very quickly express concepts without having to delve into things like file locking or uh, concurrency issues with your file system cache, which was a real question 10 years ago. The technology for the front end, such as Ajax and Flash, which are both now very mature. Flash 3.0 is a real programming language as opposed to their crazy timeline stuff, if you guys know what I'm talking about. And uh, Ajax, no matter how much I hate the, uh, the coined phrase, is actually a very nice way to encapsulate user interface that's responsive in real time, but is completely encapsulated in a web browser. With all that stack, as it's known, of tools, you can actually pick all that stuff off the web today, download it, put it on your laptop. Don't put it on your university computer unless you know exactly what it's, what's going to happen to you once you're done building your product, um, which these days, incidentally, is a lot easier. But back in the day, there were several alums that were uh, displeased with the university treat university's treatment of their uh, innovation. So I think today you're probably better off talking to your uh, entrepreneurial entrepreneurship center, which I gather you have several on campus now, so it can go wrong. But find out what that means. It's definitely uh, subject of many lawsuits, intellectual property and its ownership. Once you have all this information at your disposal, or all these tools, you can actually build a product very quickly. The typical time it takes to put together the Web 2.0 website these days is seven and a half days. You can do better since you're in a far better school than most of the people who are building Web 2.0 products are. So put it together, start, figure out your distribution strategy, which parenthetically, the best one is the one that does not require you to spend any money. The uh, $2 term for it is viral marketing, but all that really means is if using the product involves asking others to use it and you're actually genuine about it, and that proliferates where every new user that you bring on asks their friends to use it, that's it. It costs you nothing and probably makes you money in goodwill alone. So if you figure that out, you've so far spent no money. Oh, 
obviously you're not paying yourself, but I'm sure you understood that's the uh, cost of doing business. Um, you can uh, put up a server on, in a place like serverbeach.com or 55,000 other outsourced remote managed serving places for something like $200 a month and run more traffic on one machine than I could 10 years ago in a cluster. So with that sort of costs, start today. The only thing you're missing is a friend who is willing to cut a class and think about a cool consumer web idea. And I'm sure there's one in the audience right now for every one of you. Think of an idea, launch it, see what happens. In fact, if you get up and run out to start programming right now, I'll, I'll find my talk to be a success. So um, to leave some time for questions, so I, I was trying to figure out you know, what, what would be a, a good advice as far as you know, coming up with these ideas. Obviously, even though there's a dime a dozen, you've got to start somewhere. So um, I was trying to take a cue from Google that says, don't be evil. I think that's a little tired. So don't be boring. That, that's my advice. Try, try, come up, try to come up with stuff that's actually pretty crazy and innovative. Um, there's a lot of problems on campus. Your life is complicated. You're doing difficult things, and they shouldn't be difficult. Information technology is there to make lots of difficult things very, very simple. So just listing out things that give you a pain in the butt every day will give you just as many business ideas. If, you, if you're missing a list of blah, there's a website dying to happen to be the list of blah for every college in America. So just follow that thought pattern. Um, The one thing that, sort of being serious once again, I can't overstress is when you're running a consumer business, if you're running any business in general, but the one thing about consumer businesses, that it's the only tool you really have is you have to measure everything. Metricize every piece of your business that you can imagine. Number of hits that comes to your, number of people who come to your website every day, number of clicks, number of page views, number of browser types, geographic distribution over your IPs, anything you can get your hands on. Just obsess over logging that and trying to find trends. It doesn't really matter what data you're looking through, just obsess with data. Like the more obsessive you are about data, the sooner you'll find a blip on your curve. Because when you launch, it will not work. It's never worked for anyone the first time around. And that's fine. The thing that you need to worry about is once you've told 10 friends and asked them to use it, and they all said, oh, it's really crappy, you can go and look at your logs and see that they all spent no time at all on a front page. But there's this one page where they were clicking on stuff. Maybe because you put free porn on it, but they were clicking on stuff. And so that it'll tell you there's something there, and then you can start iterating. And iterating just means looking at metrics and figuring out people are doing this, let's give them more of the same. Free porn, incidentally, is a tried and true business model, but it's very competitive at this point, so it's probably not, <laughs> not such a good idea. Um, the final factoid, how would you know? The final factoid that's a little bit more serious but also valuable to know, the distribution of exits, the what happens to the companies once they're not failing anymore. So 85% of every company started in America every year will fail. That, that statistic has been true since the uh, Great Depression, which when it dropped from 100. The <laughs> first, first 85 out of 100 companies will just not make it. So don't worry about it. If you don't make it, that's your true test. Failure, incidentally, is the best lesson because if you succeed, you'll just know what you did right and there'll be occasional, oh, you know, I had it really tough the first time around. But that doesn't really teach you that much. If you're really going to start companies all your life, it's really good to fail a couple times in the beginning because one, you don't have sort of, oh, well, why did I fail this time? That, that one was okay. So you, you just want to fail as early as possible and as quickly as possible. If you're going to fail at any time, you might as well fail today. Right? Tomorrow, you can start again. But if you're not failing, what happens to your company during the Web 1.0 era, the 90, late 90s, the go-go days of the bubble, once you broke out of the sort of, my company is worth about $30 million, my VCs told me so, you could basically be like, OK, well, I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. I don't have to really turn a lot of profit. Just grow a little bit bigger and sell it to someone. The exits, the size of the pool of money you can extract for your company, was fairly well distributed. You could sell your company at 30, 40, 100, 250, 300, 500. The dynamics of why that worked are a little too, uh, too dense to go through right now, since I really want to let you guys to ask me crazy questions. But 
the interesting thing that happened in the last couple of years is there's this massive bipolar shift. If you have a company that has never taken financing, that has not taken any VC money, you just bootstrapped it, got a bunch of servers in your server beach or basement or in, in a garage and coded everything up as Ruby on Rails, chances are your company's worth somewhere below $10 million. If you have five coders working for fun, that's about $2 million per coder of value. And the people who will have you, help have you an exit event are a very short list of buyers. Google, Yahoo, Fox Interactive, Viacom, all the successful internet companies that actually generate substantial amount of cash and have the hardest time, in particular Google and Yahoo, in acquiring talent. Neither Google nor Yahoo cares about the number of your customers or what they do. All they really care about is your brain. They want you on their team because you're smart and you're doing something innovative and interesting. What that means is they're going to be willing to pay you a premium for your brain to the tune of between a half a million and two to two million per programmer. Incidentally, they don't care about your business friends or your uh, marketing accomplices or any of that. All they really care about is your technical ability and stamina. So that, that's your exit number one. Small, relatively small compared to YouTube exit by the hands of Google and its ilk. And then it's this big dead zone. It has been very difficult for most Silicon Valley and otherwise entrepreneurs to sell their company at any price above 50 to $100 million. After $100 million, it's pretty much a dead zone. There hasn't been a single acquisition with some very, very few exceptions in the last few years in the sort of middle ground. Once you're IPO material, which means your company is worth at least a half a billion dollars. The reason that's incidentally true, you used to be able to take a company public on something like NASDAQ if you had expected market cap of $300 million. That is not true anymore. Reason? Blame your congressman. They passed this crazy law called Sarbanes-Oxley, and it costs about 2 to $3 million a year just to pass all the auditing requirements. That $3 million has to come off from your bottom line. That these are your profits going to the man. So unless you have that much cash to give to auditors and various semi-governmental authorities, you really can't take a company public. You just won't have enough money to file all the required documents. Once you're worth about a half a billion dollars, that sort of implies you're making somewhere between three and thirty million dollars a year. That means you can actually go public, at which point you become an attractive acquisition target for people who don't want you to go public. They want you to be part of their team. Once again, the usual suspects, Google, Yahoo. But then they think of you very differently. Now that you're actually a valuable internet property. So if that part confused you and made you think that I've told you all sorts of stuff that you probably shouldn't know, don't worry about that part so much. Just think about running out and starting to program. Um, last two things that you should probably know about. Take lots of stats classes. All that metric stuff that I just said, it's really easier if you take statistics. Like not sort of a goofy accounting statistics, Hardcore math, old guild hall statistics. A good substitute for that is number theory or abstract algebra. It sort of all prepares you for dealing with simple numbers in complicated ways. Just sort of random classes for you to take. The other thing is never for once question the fact that you went to University of Illinois. Those of you who are not from U of I, I'm sorry, but this is sort of a me uh, talking to my homies. <laughs> it is. It is probably the best school you could go to for exactly what I'm describing. The thing that you learned here, more I mean, computer science education in Champaign is fantastic, and I'm a proud recipient of the diploma, even though I spent a lot of time trying to get people to drop out or postpone their degree so they can come work for me. But I think it's important to come back and, and do the right thing and, and, and get your diploma one day. The thing you learn in a huge state school where no one cares what your name is and you are a part of huge freshman classes where there are thousands of people and you're looking around and you know 10% is not going to be in your next class because they're going to go to Parkland is tenacity. What makes you successful as an entrepreneur is this drive to win. Like If you're willing to fail 10 times just for that 11th time when you're actually going to take a company public, that is possibly the most important thing that you can have in your brain other than really top-notch computer science education. It so happens that here you get both. Many other schools, including some of the ones that uh, end with a Ford on both sides of the Atlantic, it's hard to get in, 
but it's impossible to fail. The fact that in Champaign and places like Berkeley and CMU and just big schools, large computer science institutions, it is really easy to fail unless you stay up all night every night and just bust your ass is really good for you. Right now it feels painful, but when you're out in Silicon Valley and somebody tells you, oh man, I had to work really late last night, you're like, what are you talking about? I stayed up all night, four nights in a row, every week doing MPs. And that really goes a long way. I stayed up all night last night fixing my site, and I probably said a few things that I shouldn't have today, but uh, at least my U of I training has helped me uh, stand as opposed to uh, collapse. So uh, that, that's all I, I had prepared. Now I'll take any questions you like. Classic Corp in Delaware. Oh, sorry, I should repeat questions. Question was actually a somewhat technical one. What is the best business entity to form? It's too long to explain why, but the best business entity to form in America is a Class C corporation in Delaware. Well, the reason the IPO number is fixed is because Sarbanes-Oxley and all the regulatory filings. The reason above 100, it's very difficult to find a buyer is because at this point your programmers aren't worth $15 million a piece. So you know, Google will be willing to pay half a million dollars per programmer. I mean, essentially you can think of it as a bonus where you know, Google says, well, we're gonna sign on these brilliant guys that started a company, they're really cool. Each gets about a ha half a million dollars just for showing up. Yeah, whatever, they have $10 billion in cash right now. So they don't care. Imagine that same conversation and say, well, each one of those guys gets $10 million in cash. Like, well, can't we build it ourselves? And so that's why at a certain price, it just becomes harder and harder to actually create that sort of a pitch. How important is your idea? No, how important is the idea of angel investors to Oh. Um, it's not. Angel investors are just one more way of obtaining financing. And in general, it really, it, the discipline you need to apply here is a little bit of planning of where you see yourself going. If you think your exit strategy is to be sold for $75 million, you're far better off with angel money Oh yes, one of the things that I failed to mention is VCs are very return driven. The 10x number is very, very important. That, that's what puts you in a Hall of Fame. And so what they will want to do is push you towards shooting the moon because they actually don't care if you fail. 80% of their investments fail anyway. It's the 20% that makes huge payoff like YouTube is what's important. And so they actually don't mind if your little company failed and their $2 million or $1 million was lost. What they do mind is if you don't try, if you're trying to sell for $30 million. Because if you're trying to sell for $30 million and they invested three, that's that 10x and it might work. But between some other financing that you took and some shares that you issued to your employees, it actually starts carving into what they've done. And the reality is, you know, it was, it, was already a, it was already a tough deal for them anyway to invest $3 million. So what they want you to do is try to go for $100 million or $500 million which is very hard. If you're not going for that, be careful. Don't take VC money. Take angel money. Angels are far less return driven and far more emotionally driven where they look at you and they see themselves 10 years ago and they think, oh, I know, so cute little entrepreneur. Here's $50,000. Go make your company succeed. And if you come back and bring $100,000, they're like, yes, I doubled my money. Even though VCs look at it and go, doubled my money. You know, I could have invested in T-bills for that, which is not true, but that's what they'll tell you. <laughs> Did you guys hear the question? 
All right, so the importance of non-technical team members in the beginning, not that important. <laughs> Computer Science 97. Ah, that is a good question. So business models for, so once you get distribution, lots of traffic, have no idea how to make money. Um, monetization strategies for your consumer business, there are basically three or four. The three ones that you should try are advertising, subscriptions, and premium services. The toughest one is premium services because you have to draw the line in the sand somewhere and say, this part is free, for this you pay $19 a year, which some, Competitor viewers will show up and say, well, in our case, all of this is free, but we have this extra thing that's $5 a year, and then you're competing on price, which is tough. So some people can do that. It's tricky. It's, better, it's best expressed as very small transaction fees. The subtle version of this idea is if you have a business or if you have a company that's actually not pure consumer, but so I'm, I'm already, I, I lied to you, everything I told you is kind of a, just trying to get you to not compete with my company. So uh, PayPal is actually not a consumer company. It's a consumer to business company where people who pay PayPal are merchants on the web. They're actually baby little businesses. They think of themselves as consumers, people who sell stuff on eBay, but the real reality is they're businesses. They, they look at it as revenue, they just don't count it correctly. And they probably don't pay all the taxes that they should. So those people are okay actually paying a transaction fee because in the heart of hearts they know it's more valuable for them to do something faster, more efficiently, better, and pay a little bit for it than not. They understand efficiency. Consumers don't always understand efficiency. They're actually fairly rational, and they'll do things to save money, even though it's probably better to just pay a little bit and, and move on. So if you can figure out a business where majority of your con people who will pay you are actually baby little businesses, that is more or less the best kind, because these people are preconditioned to understand that certain small payments must be made, yet there are many of them. Small businesses make up something like 70% of all businesses in America and 80% of all businesses in the world, so it's a really large market. I like advertising better, mostly because the one I just described is what drove PayPal, and so I think I want to try something else. But advertising is great because people are okay with it now. 10 years ago, advertising on the web was actually a very tricky business to be in because technically or <coughs> factually the advertising prices collapsed very badly in 99 which contributed very strongly to the actual collapse of the bubble. Lots of people thought that companies like DoubleClick and ValueClick and all these web advertising networks would be huge and important but their reported prices and their public offerings were actually deflated by 90 to 95 percent because they just couldn't sell ads at that price because targeting wasn't good enough and a variety of other problems. Google came back, and Google and Overture, to, be, to give credit where credit's due, came back and revived the whole advertising model on the internet. At this point, the price per click and a price per action and a price per view, which is a sort of three advertising models, are very clearly understood. They're done as an open market. It's an auction-driven system, which makes it very easy to price your advertising-driven business against the market and understand how much money you could roughly make. If you build a website and it's fairly well narrowed down to some specific demographic, you know you can make 50 cents for 1,000 people who come to it. So that's sort of standard number. So advertising is actually, I think, possibly the most exciting business model on the web today. The newer flavor of it, cost per action, or being rewarded because your visitors have done something else, purchased a subscription somewhere else, or uh, decided to buy something on Amazon, is possibly where sort of the next step is. So hopefully this, this wasn't too technical a discourse or too, too boring a discourse. But uh, if you have more questions about that, I'm happy to answer them, not in the middle of this conversation. Absolutely. That goes without saying. It's clearly, uh, clearly the ideal, the American dream is, you know, you start a company, it keeps going, you build a dynasty, your children take over, their children, you know, you, you have something, something, the third who's still the CEO of the company, his grandfather started. I've 
happen to not know a single one of those on the internet, but that's not because it's not possible. It's because the uh, consumer web has only been around for 10 years. So it's not clear how long these things last. We are still in such a growth stage of this market that any time you build something really successful, someone will either try to compete with it and kill it or buy it. So that's, there really isn't very much data for companies that just decide to be profitable and keep going. Also because the market is so young and irrational, on average, you find irrational buying impulses. So you see people who price companies at 10, 15, 20 times their earnings. And so if somebody showed up and says, hey, so you're running this thing, and in 10 years, if you keep growing the way you do, you'll make 100 million net profit. Let me give you a billion dollars today. It's very difficult to say no. So despite the fact that you're actually thinking, well, it would be great to just build value and go, the uh, little yellow devil, as the uh, gold was called in, uh, in Europe at a certain point, will always make its way into your brain and tell you, you know what, sell now, because who knows, maybe this 10 years of growth is just a figment of your imagination. It takes a certain amount of discipline to actually run a company for that long and be profitable every year. It's possible in markets where it's very mature, such as natural you know, oil and gas and things like that, where you just know people are going to need oil again and again and again. Are people going to need your college classifieds website in 10 years? Maybe you should sell it for a billion dollars today. So that's, I think that's why it's sort of a bit of a difficult thing. Two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> you can guess which one I gave up on when I was a... Uh... It's not impossible, but I think your social life will suffer. Sorry? Turn up the end. Um, oh yeah, sorry. When you're, uh, so the way financing process works pretty much anywhere, you show up, you present. Sometimes they send you the uh, don't call us, we will call you email. Sometimes they'll tell you come back and pitch the full partnership, which means they're really thinking about investing. They want you to try to impress everyone else who wasn't in the first meeting. If you're successful at the, the second meeting, they will give you what's known as a term sheet, which is a short version of the investment documents you'll we'll have to sign later which essentially describe what happens to your company at the end of this financing. Usually involves all sorts of uh, vicious terms like if your company wants to sell, you have to ask me for permission first. And you start negotiating where you say, well, you know, I, I don't want to be dependent on your decision making here. And you, you horse trade one thing for the other where you say, you know, we'll, we'll reduce our valuation or take more money or give you more percentage of the company. There's no formula, unfortunately. So the question was, what, what is the, uh, you know, what's the formula? There really isn't one. The thing that makes the decision easier for you is in the end, you know in your heart of hearts what's important to you right now. If it's your first company, chances are you don't mind giving up more control because you don't actually know what to do with the control. Once you're doing your second or third or fourth company, you've learned the lessons where possibly some mean VC has booted you off the board or fired you and replaced him with his own CEO. And then you go, oh yeah, I better have some control. One of the things that happens to you as you build more companies and fail or succeed, you find friends, if such things are possible, in the VC community. <laughs> I'm, I'm being far too, far too mean, incidentally. Two of my closest friends are venture capitalists, and uh, one of them was the chief financial officer at PayPal and then went to join Sequoia Capital. So uh, I, have, I can only be as mean as I am to VCs in this talk outside the Silicon Valley because my friend Roloff will probably come down from the sky and choke me. So, but I, I can be rude here. So you, you build relationships in the industry and over time you know, it's not just you go to every VC on Sand Hill Road and you say, please, please give me money. You actually go to the ones you know and say, hey, we've known each other for so many years. Let's not mess around, just let's, let's do something here. And over time it becomes easier and easier to establish these deals literally on a handshake. The term sheets become a formalization of something that you established over coffee, not the other way around. So negotiation becomes simpler over time, 
And you also learn a lot about what's important to you personally. Some things are really dependent on what your exit strategy might be. For example, things like registration rights, which are very important for the IPO and not at all important for a sale exit, are either negotiated over with great heat and venom or are ignored on both sides because you know you're not going to take the company public. So it's, it's something that just I think you learn naturally and you sort of know what's important to you. The question is, do I feel that the business plan is overrated if you're building a consumer application? I feel the business plan is overrated for any application. I think uh, if you have a plan and it's really precise, you're overthinking and not programming enough. <laughs> I'm completely serious about that one. Um, is your company ready to, to go public? <laughs> Um, this, the question is, wh wh what's the sign that your company's ready to go public other than being able to pay off the $3 million for the Sarbanes-Oxley audits? These days, I think it has to be profitable. I think it has to show at least a few quarters of growth. Growth has to be fairly robust and hopefully stunning so the general public can appreciate. And what are you really doing when you're taking a company public, incidentally? It's the same exact pitch you gave to venture capitalists. But the thing about those guys, they're very sophisticated. They've seen a million pitches, and you're just one in a long stream of entrepreneurs. When you're taking a company public, all you're really doing is you're saying, hey, the world, I have some shares to sell, and you want to buy them, right? We are a good company because. And that because better be simple and easy to understand and true, because uh, thanks to Sarbanes-Oxley, you'll go to jail if you're lying. Oh, or, and, and other laws, too. But. Uh, M minor, minor. Right. So if you have awesome growth you will, uh, and profitability, I think that's good, good, uh, good markers. Sarbanes actually did do something nice in the sense that it's very easy to separate IPO material from not. If you can't afford your Sarbanes Oxley filings, you can't go public. Mark is standing up, which means that I'm probably taking up time from your uh, next event. Um, a break. All right, uh, I'm here all week, or well, I'm here till tomorrow morning. <laughs> so uh, you can find me uh, roaming around and trying to poach students. Um, if, you are, uh, if you're not yet certain what you want to do with your life, but you're thinking of starting companies, you can come and turn at slide and you can see how it's done from the safety of, uh, of an internship. <laughs>